America's Civil War, the war between the states, raged for four years and killed more than 600,000 soldiers. It involved young men and their families from every corner of the country, from Maine to California, from Florida to Arizona. An estimated 90,000 of them came from Texas. In 1860, Texas was still a raw frontier. Only 600,000 people inhabited its 268,601 square miles. Most of the state was largely empty, except for small bands of Comanche and Kiowa Indians on their way to and from raids in Mexico. Even so, most everyone in the nation knew that Texas was where a person could make a good life with a little hard work. Many ambitious settlers came during the 1850s and found a place that was promising and largely free. I have traveled nearly 500 miles across Texas and am now enabled to judge pertinent correctly of its soil and the resources, and I have no hesitancy in pronouncing it the finest country to this extent upon the globe. Not just anyone could cut it in Texas. Those that fear combat are neither constitutionally, morally, nor physically qualified to become citizens of such a dangerous country, either in war or peace. By the beginning of the Civil War, the new state was overwhelmingly young and male. These self-reliant pioneers in just a single generation had carved a name for themselves, fighting Mexicans and Indians, establishing a republic, and had built farms and ranches from the wilderness. They had come from all over the world, but mostly from the South, and Texas became more and more Southern with each passing day and each new arrival. When the nation's sectional crisis broke in 1861, Texas sided with the other southern states. The governor of the state, Sam Houston, had worked hard to get Texas into the Union and was certainly not ready to go out lightly. He demanded a vote by the people of Texas on the issue. Texans passed the issue overwhelmingly, and Sam Houston, one of the framers of the state, resigned, not wanting to be a part of what he considered a grand tragedy. The shooting nearly started in Texas. In 1861, there were more federal troops in Texas than any other state. And for several weeks, tensions remained pretty high while state officials tried to talk these commands into leaving the state and leave their weapons and equipment behind. U.S. authorities evacuated the state leaving the frontier forts and the depot at the Alamo in Texan hands. When the new Confederacy began building armies, Texans answered the call. You know with what spirit I joined, that it was neither for fame nor gain, but an uncontrollable sense of duty to my country. 
William Moody, 7th Texas Infantry. Tom Green, a veteran of Texas wars, saw his duty clearly. The battle for the right to govern ourselves and control our own institutions had to be fought with the fanatics of the North at some time, and I expect it had as well be by us as our children. We are no doubt better prepared for the fight than our children would have been and will bring more nerve to the conflict than they would as the injuries received from the nasal twang, self-righteous, witch-killing fanatics are more recent and fresh with us. The whole state of Texas expects me to take part in this war, and I would feel that I had more grievously disappointed my friends and the people of the state if I had remained at home while the war was raging. No man is looked to more to show his hand in this struggle. I would go to the service if I positively knew that the first shot fired would kill me. I am determined to bequeath to my children a name they will in all future time be proud of. Other Texas heroes were among those who led. Albert Sidney Johnston, whom President Jefferson Davis considered the best general he had, commanded the critical Western line in Kentucky. And Ben McCullough, who had led Texans in the Mexican War, faced the Yankees in Missouri and Arkansas. Men of Texas, look to your arms. Texans, remember your former victories and prepare to march to others. You won your independence from Mexico and will do it again. When the shooting started that summer, Texans headed for the thick middle of it. They even led the first Confederate offensive by invading New Mexico in the summer of 1861. Before long, Texas battle flags and the men who carried them bore bullet holes and battle honors from many a hard fight, grim reminders of the days of blood and glory. As the war progressed, Texans earned a reputation for being among the best troops in the Confederacy, including Terry's Texas Rangers in Tennessee and John Bell Hood's brigade in Longstreet's Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. General Lee liked the Lone Star Troop so much he wanted more. I have not heard from you with regard to the new Texas regiments. I need them very much. I rely upon those we have in all tight places. They have fought grandly and nobly, and we must have more of them. With a few more such regiments as those which Hood has now, I could feel much more confident. Texans, troops of other states have their reputations to gain. The sons of the defenders of the Alamo have theirs to maintain. I'm assured that you will be faithful to that trust, Jefferson Davis. But Texans weren't just upholding their honor on distant battlefields. Only two Confederate state capitals never felt the tramp of Union boots during the war, Tallahassee, Florida, and Austin, Texas. It wasn't because the Yankees didn't try. The first time federal forces tried to invade was in late 1862, when a naval expedition captured the largest city in the state, Galveston, and blockaded the port at Sabine Pass. They also bombarded Corpus Christi. In the fall of that year, things looked bleak. Everyone expected a full-scale Union invasion in the coming months, and most feared the outcome. My worst fears have been realized. The coast of the serverless state of Texas has been surrendered to the enemy without a blow struck in its defense. I cannot express the deep grief, the shame, the crushing humiliation with which I was overwhelmed at the reception of this disastrous intelligence. Where was the proud Texas chivalry displayed at the Alamo, San Antonio, Concepcion, San Jacinto, Oak Hills, Elkhorn, Williamsburg, the Chickahominy, Manassas, Sharpsburg, upon every bloody field. The veteran Texan didn't have to fret long. 
the Confederacy sent General Prince John Magruder to right the situation in Texas, and he did it with flair. Taking Old River steamers and re-equipping with cotton bale armor, Magruder used his so-called cotton clads to make a land-sea attack on the Federals at Galveston. On New Year's Day, 1863, he whipped the Federals soundly, and Commodore Leon Smith captured one warship, the Harriet Lane, two supply vessels, and nearly 300 prisoners, besides scaring the Federals into destroying their grounded flagship, the Westfield. The surprise victory stunned the Yankees. I found Admiral Farragut in the dumps about the Galveston affair. His professional pride seemed to be touched. It was certainly well done and well planned by the Confederates. General Banks also seems to be low-spirited and accepts the certainty of the fall of the Republic. I do not see myself what ground there is for hope. The confident tone of the Northern press is gone and the Southern papers are filled with accounts of victory. Lieutenant Colonel David Hunter Struther. The New Englanders captured that day couldn't believe that they had been beaten by such shoddy looking characters. They had all kinds of arms, but the most curious thing about them was their dress. There were no uniforms, but everyone was dressed in homemade clothes. Some were decked out with tassels and feathers like so many Indians, and they appeared like a party of savages. Many of them wore blankets, which were of all colors and descriptions. Some had only a piece of old carpeting tied on with a string. The greater part of them had long hair reaching to their shoulders. Their hats were also of all shapes and sizes, from the deerskin skull cap to the one and a half foot brim straw hat. Many had on moccasins instead of shoes. They were wild with joy at the result of the battle. We were the first troops which had landed in their state and they had captured us at the first attempt. How they cheered. None of our good old Yankee hurrahs, however, but a sort of war whoop, and on every side resounded their wild, triumphant Yahoo. Happy New Year, shouted someone. Yes, happy to you, but not to us, we thought. Private George Fisk, 42nd Massachusetts. Magruder pulled off a similar feat just two weeks later at Sabine Pass, destroying two Union blockaders there and reopening the port. He couldn't have been prouder of his Texans. The Federals tried again. At Sabine Pass on September 8, 1863, Captain Frank Odlum, Lieutenant Richard Dowling, and a group of about 60 determined Texans in a unit called the Davis Guards used six guns and a whole lot of guts to turn back a Union invasion of 5,000 men and four gunboats, capturing two of the Union warships in the process. It was the kind of disaster that caused the New York Stock Exchange to fall and Northerners to howl at their misfortune. Grateful citizens of Texas, led by a Houston priest among others, raised funds to create medals out of silver dollars for each of Dowling's men, each one suspended by a green ribbon. On one side was a Maltese cross with DG for the unit's name, the Davis Guard, and Battle of Sabine Pass, September 8, 1863, on the other side. These were the only medals officially authorized by any Southern entity during the entire war and are among the most rare of Confederate artifacts. The Yankees did manage to take a little bit of Texas later that year. They captured the windswept sand dunes of Padre and Mustang Islands, the town of Brownsville, and not much else. Even though many Texans served among their cousins and kinfolk in Virginia and Tennessee, most served in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. It was a practical matter. The battles of Texas will be fought in Louisiana. There it behooves us to strike for our homes. Houston Tri Weekly. The fall of the Confederate Mississippi forts at Vicksburg and Port Hudson, Louisiana, 
forever stopped the flow of significant numbers of Texans from heading east to Virginia and Tennessee. Even so, most Texans preferred staying closer to the Lone Star State anyway. I didn't come to Arkansas to die. I think God would never resurrect me from here. Das Leben ist ziemlich langweilig und mein einziger Vergnügen ist es, am Heim zu denken. Du hast geschrieben, dass ich zu Hause sein könnte, wenn die Pfirsiche reifen. Ich glaube aber, dass die Pfirsiche vielmals reifen werden, bevor wir endlich nach Hause kommen. Josef Faust, 7. Texas Kavallerie. Texans serving in these states fought off a determined Union invasion in 1864, handing the Yankees one of their soundest drubbings of the war. The Red River Campaign was certainly one of the high points for Texans in Confederate service. Union General Nathaniel P. Banks and 50,000 troops, along with a huge fleet of gunboats, headed for Shreveport, Louisiana, and Texas beyond. Instead, Confederate forces, although greatly outnumbered, ambushed the Federals near Mansfield, Louisiana, and rolled the Union Army back to Alexandria, and eventually back to the Mississippi, harassed the entire way by Texas troops. At home, though, the war caused hardships. Not only were prices high due to the blockade, but regular news of casualties on distant battlefields worried the families these soldiers had left behind. Dearest James, I daily pray for you. I hope the time is not far distant when we shall see each other. But if not permitted to me any more in this world, I believe and hope we will meet in heaven. And oh, the thought of meeting our loved ones where there is no more parting forever, it fills my soul with warm emotion. Oh, I'm so tired of this war. I've worked harder since this war commenced than I ever did before. I do wish the whole Yankee nation would sink and become an ocean of water. I do hate the cowards. I wish them all the bad wishes I can think of. If I was a soldier, I never would take any prisoners. I would kill all I could. The horses were saddled at daylight and the girls rode with us. On reaching our parting place, we all got off our horses, joined hands, and sang, God be with you till we meet again. If there was a dry eye among the 16 of us, I didn't see it. Some of the girls rode off with their faces in their hands. Three out of the eight boys never saw their sweethearts again. The months and years of campaigning also took their toll on the Texans in the field. There were also plenty of dangers west of the Sabine River and south of the Red River as well. Jayhawkers, Unionists, Indians, and plain old bandits might strike at any time. Several hundred Texans, like the men of Borders Regiment, served on the frontier against an increase in Comanche and Kiowa raids, and local feuds turned into murder from the hanging of two dozen people in Gainesville, to the ambush assassination near Bonham, to ethnic and political strife in the hill country, the coastal bend, and far south Texas. The Civil War played out even among the isolated cabins of the folks at home. These were tough times, no matter where you were in the Confederate States. The war caused all Texans to choose sides. 7% of Texans in 1860 were immigrants from foreign countries, making it second only to Louisiana for the highest percentage of foreign-born residents in a Confederate state. At least eight Texas regiments enlisted significant numbers of Germans. Tejanos from Webb, Refugio, and Bayar counties served in every theater of the war. Other nationalities also weighed in, including Norwegians, Poles, Frenchmen, Irishmen, Dutch, English, Scots, and Swedes. Officers in the 3rd Texas Infantry routinely gave instructions in three languages, German, Spanish, and English. By the summer of 1864, 
Texans serving east of the Mississippi were fighting in the final cataclysmic struggles of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of Tennessee. They acquitted themselves well. General Robert E. Lee considered the three regiments of Texans with him to be his best troops. Never mind the raggedness. The enemy will never see the back of my Texans. At the wilderness, these soldiers of the Texas Brigade turned back a Union breakthrough and saved Robert E. Lee's army. I would charge hell itself for that old man. Leonard G. Hood's Texas Brigade. In the fighting around Atlanta, the Texans of Hiram Granberry's brigade in Cleburne's division also held the line. Forward, men, forward. Never let it be said that Texans lag in the fight. Hiram Granberry. The rowdy soldiers of Matthew Ector's brigade did their share of fighting as well. If and we ever got whipped, I don't recollect it. Lieutenant General William J. Hardy, when considering what his Texas cavalry meant to him, said it best. I always feel safe when the Rangers are in front. At Franklin, Tennessee, Texans did their duty and made a valiant assault against long odds, an ill-advised attack by any estimation that became the Lone Star equivalent of Pickett's charge. The Confederate Army of Tennessee unable to stop Sherman from marching through Georgia, had instead headed into Tennessee to try and cause a distraction and threaten the vital Union base at Nashville. Instead, the Confederates ran headlong into a federal blocking force at Franklin. The Southerners launched an all-out assault to try to move the blue coats, but the resulting carnage, six generals dead, including Pat Cleburne and Texan Hiram Granberry, and thousands of sorely needed troops killed or wounded, the attempt proved much too costly. East of the Mississippi, the Yankees just steadily ground down the Confederate forces, including the Texans. West of the Mississippi, though, it was a different story. When U.S. forces captured Vicksburg and Port Hudson and took control of the Mississippi, Texas became isolated along with Louisiana, Arkansas, and the rest of the Trans-Mississippi Confederacy. After the Southern victory in the Red River Campaign, the majority of Texans in Confederate service found themselves largely idle and did not participate in any major campaign for the remaining 11 months of the war. Union gunboats prevented them from going east and lending a hand to the troops fighting and dying there. The last fight worthy of being called a battle during the Civil War occurred on Texas soil. A Union expedition of white and black soldiers moved inland to capture Brownsville and were repulsed at the Battle of Palmito Ranch in early May, nearly a month after the main rebel army had called it quits in Virginia and North Carolina. When the Confederacy collapsed in 1865, Texans returned to their farms and ranches to rebuild their lives. On June 19, U.S. General Gordon Granger arrived at Galveston, Texas, to reassert federal authority in the state. He also read a statement announcing to the slaves of Texas that they were forever free. Texas faced a far different future than the past that had been left on the battlefields of the Civil War. As these former Confederates returned home, they discovered that the cattle on the Texas range had done a good job of getting along without their owners, and hundreds of thousands roamed the prairie and the thickets. Enterprising men, having been hardened by war, rounded up these cattle and drove them overland to distant markets, selling Texas beef to hungry Yankees. Before long, Texas, unlike the rest of the former Confederacy, was booming, and cow towns like Fort Worth stood in stark contrast to the burned-out wrecks 
of Richmond, Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia, and Alexandria, Louisiana. Texas once again resumed its place as the land where a person could make a future, and former Confederates from all over the South began migrating to Texas to start over. They hung a sign, GTT, for gone to Texas, on their cabins, then headed west. The numbers of farms started in Texas by newly arrived Southerners increased 2,000% in the 15 years after the war. Heritage organizations like the United Confederate Veterans, the Daughters of the Confederacy, and the Sons of Confederate Veterans thrived in Texas, nourished by the talents of men and women who arrived from across the South. Their names still lay across the land. 29 counties in Texas bear names that are in some way directly related to the Civil War Several Lone Star cities also honor Confederates or their leaders. And of course, there are the old Texas cemeteries. Here, from El Paso to Orange, from Pampa to McAllen, even casual observers will read weathered headstones with the names of Confederates who may have been born in another state and served in its regiments, but lived in Texas in their later years. In the end, Texas did its share in the Civil War and emerged a stronger place than it had been going in. Its men had done what Texans have done from the beginning. They fought and fought well in the cause of their country. They returned with their honor intact from having done their fair share. And since they had ably kept the Federals from invading, they returned to intact homes and cities, which also attracted former comrades from other states. The Civil War, America's war between the states, created the conditions that would launch Texas into decades of prosperity and development. In many ways, it set the stage for the Texas we love today. <laughs>